Hello and welcome to another WSI webinar. Uh, we're happy that you're able to join us live today. Before we get started, I just want to make sure we do a quick uh, visual and sound check. So if you can just type into the uh, question box to let us know if you can hear us, see us okay, see our slides, that would be great. Awesome. So it looks like we're coming through loud and clear. Um, Again, thanks for joining us for another WSI Digital Marketing Webinar. This time we're talking about the topic of LinkedIn and specifically succeeding in the new normal with LinkedIn and giving you tips on strengthening your network and brand. My name is Cheryl Baldwin. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications at WSI Corporate and I'll be your host today. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of the presentation, I just wanna cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, and specifically answer a couple of questions that we have right off the bat. Um, we will be recording this session uh, and we will be sharing this recording after the fact, so don't worry, you'll be able to listen back. We also share the slides as well, so uh, you'll be getting a, copies of, a copy of those later on today after the webinar too. We will be running a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so generally speaking, um, we run this webinar for around 45 minutes. That includes Q&A. So we'll have some time left over uh, in that time to handle your questions. So just type them into the question box and we'll get to as many as we can um, in our time with you today. Now, if you have any audio issues, you can send a note to us in the question area so we can help sort it out. But sometimes just disconnecting and jumping back on or toggling between the computer and phone options will help address those issues. So before we uh, really get into stuff, I want to just kind of give a quick synopsis of who WSI is, what we're about. Um, WSI has been around for 25 years. So our goal and our passion is really helping transform the businesses uh, of the clients we work with and help them navigate the complexity of the digital marketing world. And so whether you're someone that's just getting started with digital marketing or have been using it for a long time, we're here to help take your marketing goals and help achieve those goals and take them to the next level for you. Um, one of the ways, things we like to do also is keep you educated on what's happening with digital marketing in the form of these types of webinars. So as I mentioned today, our session is on LinkedIn um, and how you can use it more effectively to uh, network and foster new business relationships, to promote your brand, um, and to sell your services. So I know generally speaking, when we think of LinkedIn, some of us think it's just to, you know, career search for job recruit uh, recruiting and stuff like that. But really LinkedIn is way, way more than that and offers a lot to your business in the forms of allowing you to expand the reach of your brand, um, to generate more sales uh, ready leads and to even network especially in a virtual world like we are in today. And so, um, again, what we want to make sure is we peel back the layers a little bit more on LinkedIn today and give you some key tips, tips and strategies on how you can leverage some of the aspects of LinkedIn most effectively for your business, because there's a lot of different things you can do there. And so I'm really excited to have our presenter, uh, Gunnar Hood, join us today. Now, Gunnar is one of our very own WSI digital marketing consultants. He's been with us for more than eight years. Um, but during that time, he's really built a niche uh, and become a LinkedIn expert as well. And he has been educating the business world, individuals, professionals on LinkedIn for multiple years. So I'm super excited to have him join us and share uh, his passion about LinkedIn with all of you. Um, so Gunnar, can you uh, maybe turn on your webcam and just say hi to everyone? Hey everybody, it's nice to be hey, here. Hey, Thank hey. you for joining us. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to pass it over to you so you can take everyone through uh, some really great information. Well, great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Cheryl. Delighted to be here and uh, glad to help out where I can. Um, I always like to start with just a quick survey. We'll take about 30 seconds to run a quick survey. So I have a sense of where people are and that helps me frame some of my comments as we go through the slides. So if you will, look for the poll that comes up on your screen and uh, you know, help us understand 
what primary marketing challenge are you looking to solve today? Maybe it's uh, how to better showcase your products and services, or the, the question and answers disappeared from my screen, but I think you should be able to see them. And then I'll get the results here in just a second. So we'll take oh. about another, hopefully everybody can uh, respond to that. We'll take about another 15 seconds to give you a chance to answer that question. Gunnar, you know, sorry, I think what happened is it automatically closed on us for some reason. So what I'm gonna ask people to do instead is just go into the chat or the question box and based on uh, why you're here today, maybe tell us a little bit about your main goals you're trying or challenges you're trying to solve. Some of them were um, amplifying the visibility of your of, and reach of your brand, to generate more sales ready leads for your business, to sell more products and services uh, to your target audience, and to create more meaningful business connections. Um, just let us know and I can kind of give you a little bit of information as you're talking about what people are saying. And since you have free response, you can also say all of the above at this point. Yeah, some of the stuff we're just having come in right now is uh, amplifying, definitely amplifying more business connections, um, a lot to do with all of the above, um, you know, selling more services. It, it, Oh, so much stuff coming through right now, but connections and visibility and sales are definitely leading the way on, on the main marketing challenges. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for, you know, that and apologize for the technical issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a webinar if there's not at least one technical issue. So we're, we're good now. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, what I want to cover with you in about a 30 minute time frame this morning is just a, a few key things. One is really understanding what's the business case for LinkedIn in the new normal. What, what's happened, you know, through the pandemic and other circumstances to make this a valuable tool or more valuable than where we were before. And with that in mind, you know, how do you go about building your brand personality or your brand visibility, I should say, for your personal brand, and then establish really good connections with others that can help you grow your business? And for the connections you haven't yet made, how do you then attract others through thought leadership on the platform? And if you still have an appetite for really uh, growing your business further, there's always the advertising option. So we'll touch on that a little bit as well. If we go to the next slide, uh, I always like to start out by asking a question. And that is, if you think back throughout the, the year 2020 and compare that to 2019, what changes have you made from a digital perspective in your business that you wouldn't have considered making if it weren't for something like COVID? For some people, it might be, you know, how important did your website become this year? Did you start migrating more towards LinkedIn? What are the changes you made? And there's kind of a second question behind that, and that is, if you think about where you were from a comfort zone perspective at the beginning of the year and where you are now, how has that changed for you as well? When I talk to clients and others uh, that I meet with on a regular basis, they, they've kind of said, you know, I feel like I've been living outside of my comfort zone almost the entire year this year. Every day there's a different set of circumstances that are challenging me to think and grow differently. And, you know, when we talk about it, I say that's really not such a bad thing um, that actually growth occurs most when you're stepping outside of that comfort zone. So let's take a look at that on the next slide. You know, when people lean into discomfort, they do find that there's opportunities for growth. You learn new skill sets, you, you know, maybe you're trying a new workout regimen, things like that. It only happens when there's growth. So let me use an analogy when it comes to, you know, digital as well. If you were to try something for the first time, your expectation of being an expert probably is ill-placed. If you wanted to try darts, the chances that you would hit the center bullseye on a recurring basis as a novice is probably pretty small. You know, in fact, probably 98% of the time your shots, if you even get it on the board, may land somewhere outside the board. When it comes to LinkedIn, I found very similar circumstances with the people that I work with. In many cases, 98% of them are missing the bullseye. And it's not meant to be a criticism. It's an observation that says, there's huge opportunity for people that are willing to put in some time and effort and step outside of that comfort zone 
in order to become that 2% that hits the center bullseye on a regular basis. And so that's what I hope to share with you as some tips today. So why even bother with this? Well, when you think about the impact of the pandemic and other things, all of those in-person meetings that we were experiencing before, the local networking meetings, chamber of commerce meetings, or the trade shows and conferences that we would go to, everything's mostly been put on hold. And so what are your options? Well, thankfully there is that option that you have something like LinkedIn to defer to, to help you do these things on a virtual basis. My guess is many of you have been on a number of Zoom calls, go-to meetings, other things as ways to kind of offset that. But oftentimes if you're just a participant, that only gets you so far. So what can you do proactively through LinkedIn to make a difference and build your business? So as we look at the next slide, I wanna share with you some numbers that might make this more meaningful for you. For one, LinkedIn is the one network where you're going to find a plethora of decision makers, over 63 million of them. That's huge. That's not something that's easy to find on other social channels very easily. We've also seen companies jump on the bandwagon and say, hey, there's something here. We need to make sure we have a company presence on LinkedIn. And it's estimated over 51% of companies now have that presence. When you look at it from a lead generation standpoint, LinkedIn accounts for 80% of all the business to business leads from social media. So it is the primary channel for that. And we also find that lead conversion is three times greater on LinkedIn than what you're gonna find on any other social channel, even the next nearest channel. But what's fascinating to me is it's also been voted the most trusted network. So if you combine that with the fact that you have a tremendous number of decision makers on there, other data studies have said that LinkedIn is the first place they often go to when they need to vet a service, a product, or other uh, issues and problems that they're having. If they're not turning to their own trusted network on LinkedIn, they're searching it for people that can help them. Earlier, or just recently, McKinsey also released this, the results of a study. They had uh, surveyed a number of decision makers saying, hey, you know, how has your business changed you know, in terms of sales processes this year because of COVID? And many of the companies you know, responded by saying, you know, well, for business to happen, and it still had to happen, it just had to happen differently, we made an immediate shift to digital using virtual meetings like Zoom or uh, self-assistant tools like chatbots and things like that. And 75% of them said, we actually prefer those interactions now to what we were doing before, citing things like economies of scale, efficiency, cost, things of that sort. But they're also very effective. And surprisingly, the amount of money that decision makers are willing to spend on a purchase, if we look at the next slide, may very much surprise you too. 27% of the respondents said they were willing to spend half a million to a million dollars on a purchase just through virtual meetings and self-service options. That's a big game changer for a lot of companies out there. So McKinsey kind of summed it up by saying, here's the big thing, the big takeaway from that is, companies are willing to make this shift and go more digital for their B2B selling processes are gonna have a competitive advantage over the laggards behind them. They're not only going to get more customers, they're going to have more loyal customers. So the takeaway there is, if you haven't got on board yet, there's still time, but start moving. It's the right time. So welcome to virtual networking. This is what it's all about. And the first thing you want to consider when it comes to virtual networking is, how is it different than traditional networking? And I think the biggest word you can use is it's scalable relationship building. And what I mean by that is if you think about how you networked in the past, you might jump in the car, you go down to a local meeting, there's you know any number of people in there, you get to meet a few of them, and in some cases, the ones that you meet aren't even really your ideal target audience, but you meet them and you have a couple drinks and you get in the car, you head back home. So there's a lot of time investment in there and sometimes you even pay to go to those events, especially if it's a trade show or a conference. So there's in investments in different ways that you're involved in there, and it doesn't always get you the results that you're looking for. When you take a look at LinkedIn, it's scalable because it's very time efficient. It sits there in front of you anytime you want to access it. You don't have to jump in the car, go anywhere. It's always there. It, the biggest difference, I think, though, is that it's informed. 
And that is you can do your research and, and target specific individuals, people that are your ideal candidates for doing business with, either them, you or vice versa, and learn about them up front and determine, is that somebody I want to connect with? You don't get that option when you go to a in-person networking session unless you pull out your phone and you have LinkedIn up there and you, as soon as you're standing in front of them, you go, oh, your name is this? Oh, I see you do this. That's pretty awkward. But from a LinkedIn perspective online, you have lots of opportunities there. You also get more visibility. If you walked into a normal networking session, usually a sponsor gets the visibility in front of the room. They get to say things about their company. People go, oh, that's what I want to talk to. As an individual, you don't. But on LinkedIn, when you're connected with multiple people, anytime you post something, that gets seen by a lot of different people out there. So it gives you that stage almost at any time that you want it. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. There is an option to pay if you want. And most importantly, too, it's available 24-7. So you can see it and be seen any time that's convenient for you, not just when it's slated at a given time. So here's the scalable part, is that let's say you've got a 1,000 connections on LinkedIn, and each one of those 1,000 connections are also connected to a 1,000 people. That puts you just one person away from interacting with as many as a million people on LinkedIn. That's pretty powerful not something you could easily do in an in-person environment. And so the scalability is one of the biggest features you'll find as an advantage. So to start using LinkedIn, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you've shored up your personal brand. And LinkedIn rates your personal profile in three categories, beginner, intermediate, and all-star. And all-star is really where you want to be for multiple reasons. One, there's eight different things that you need to complete at a minimum to build out an all-star profile. I'll touch on a couple here, but Cheryl and her team have built out a really handy ebook that you can request from the person who invited you or, or the WSI consultant that you work with. They'll have access and can share it with you. If you still don't see it, email us or you know, connect with us on LinkedIn and we'll get it to you. But the point is that there's lots of different things that you can put on your profile that make it easy for people to uh, begin to get to know you even before you connect. And when you have reached all-star status, it actually increases your reach by at least 50%. And that's part of the reason you're on LinkedIn in the first place is to be seen and uh, get your uh, thoughts out there to people. I will say that when we've worked with uh, individuals and companies, they do say that building the profile is hard. The technical aspects are easy, but talking about themselves is often a difficult venture. I find the same thing. It's hard for me to talk about myself. What I found is that you know, start with a colleague that you work with, ask them, you know, share things back and forth about what you do, successes you've had, who you've helped most, and think about that and put, help get their help putting those into words. If you don't have somebody like that, then reach out to one of our consultants or, you know, hire somebody else or, or go with somebody you know, but that makes the process that much easier. They often will say things about you that you never would think to say about yourself. The next thing you want to do is Take the focus away from yourself and make it about how you help others. It's not as much a resume tool as it was 10 years ago. It's more about helping people find people to solve their problems. And in the last two years, we've seen an even greater shift away from just stating what you do to how you help others. And that might mean that in, you know, we, when we work with XYZ company, we brought this solution to the table that delivered ABC results for their company. That's what decision makers are looking for. They don't want to get involved in conversation with you until they understand you have a way to help them. And doing that means making sure you've got that as many case studies on your profile. You can also do that by adding rich content, which are slides like PowerPoint slides, PDF documents, and even videos. And the best place to put those is in a place called the featured section. It's relatively new from a LinkedIn perspective and it sits high up on your profile. So it makes it easy for others to find and locate this content. They don't have to dig around and look for it elsewhere. So let's take a look. You know, here's an example of somebody that falls in the 98% category from a profile perspective. They've got a picture, but they haven't put any effort. They've got 12 connections on here. This is from a digital marketing perspective in my community. Now let's compare that to my profile, just uh, for argument's sake. The difference here is that I've got a picture and you wanna make sure you're using a picture that aligns with your target audience. If you're a dog trainer, it makes sense to have a dog in there. If you're not, then what does make sense to your audience or is gonna make them go, yeah, that, that looks like the kind of person I should work with. 
Take advantage of the banner at the top. Most people leave it blank, but it's a way to include branding about your company, talk more about what you do, give them different perspective about you. One of the biggest changes we saw this year on LinkedIn is the headline. Most people default to just their job title. And that's a huge missed opportunity. Think of it instead like a billboard at the two busiest intersections in your community that you get to put advertising on for free. What message do you want people to walk away with and be able to search for? Makes it easy for them to figure out who you are, what you do. You've got 220 characters to use there, which is up from 120. That's one of the biggest changes they made this year. It used to only be available on mobile, but now it's on the desktop. The other thing is uh, your name. You'll see that there's a dot next to my the first initial of my name, and I'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. But these are just a few of the eight things that you want to optimize on your profile to help build out your personal brand. Now let's talk about some other things as well. There's a tool that helps you keep score. You know, if you're playing games or doing anything else, keeping score is always important. They've got this great tool called the Social Selling Index. There's a little link in the right-hand corner you can go to to find this. Everybody's got one. And whatever your number is, just accept it. That's the starting point. That's your baseline. And there's four measured areas that they look at in order to score you. And the goal here is that you want to get that number up to at least 60. Because when you combine a social selling index score of 60 with an all-star profile, your visibility increases dramatically on LinkedIn. It puts you in an elite category, basically. Um, and each one of those components, there's LinkedIn learning sessions that you can uh, visit to learn more about each of the elements for professional brand, connecting with the right people, engaging with insights, and building relationships. But the goal is look at your weakest one, focus on that first, and then kind of work your way through the process. So here's, here's an example of you know uh, why it also makes sense to build out your profile. And one of the questions I often get is, how many connections is the right number? Is it, is it a quantity game or is it quality? I say it's, there's a little bit of both in there, but quality trumps quantity in most cases, with one exception. You first want to set a goal of getting to 500 connections. The reason for that is, is that everybody sees how many you have up until you get to 500. Then they stop showing. It's just over 500. So that tells people that you've put some time and effort into making connections out there. Uh, the second thing is that LinkedIn is watching. They pay attention to who you're connecting with and help show you or introduce you to others based on who you're connecting with. If you're connecting with anybody and everybody, they don't really know what to make of that. But if you say my target audience is the C-suite in this particular industry and that's why I keep reaching out to connect with, they get that and they'll show you more of those people and vice versa. So, you know, why does it make a difference? Well, if I were looking for a commercial banker in my community, I would want one that can do more than just uh, manage my deposits and help me from a lending perspective, I see bankers as somebody uh, that has relationships that they can introduce me to others that might help my business. And so Clint, unfortunately, only has one connection, hasn't put any time and effort on here. But Brian, by comparison, has over 500 connections. If those were my two choices, I'd be picking up the phone and calling Brian or connecting with him on LinkedIn saying, hey, you know, how can, how can we help each other? And so it, it becomes a very visible, easy to recognize symbol of where people are putting time and effort on LinkedIn. Other things you should know is that, you know, how do you find the right connections? And LinkedIn has made some pretty significant changes to their search feature this year. Previously, you would just pick people, companies, groups by category and then do your searches. In this case, I typed in commercial banking to stay with the theme. And instead of getting it siloed by category, they show me a plethora of content related to first some people, then some jobs in commercial banking, then there'll be some more people followed by some articles that have been written. If any of your connections have read any of these articles, that'll be displayed on there for you. There'll be more people and then it shows you groups. So they're trying to expose their membership to more and more things that are available because oftentimes if people didn't think to look at those, they didn't know they existed. You can still find, you can still narrow down your target uh, searches by using any of those buttons at the top. And then to the far right, you'll find one that is all filters. So if you did say, I'm looking for a commercial banker in Houston that focuses on the energy industry, you would want to use the advanced filters to narrow that down to get a limited number of results. Now that you're looking at them, you say, these are the kind of people I want to connect with. What do you do? Well, look at their profiles, review them. 
try and understand, you know, are, have they developed their profiles? Do they say the things that make sense to what you can help with or where you need help? And, you know, look for common ground. Do you have, most importantly, a connection in common, somebody that might be able to introduce the two of you? If not, you know, did you go to the same college? Did, uh, do you have similar interests? Have you worked at different companies, you know, together? All those kinds of things become common ground and make it much easier to connect with people. But you can also create curiosity. LinkedIn, 75% of LinkedIn members say their favorite feature is the who's viewed my profile feature. As a free member, you get five, you can see the five most recent views on your profile. As a paid member, you can see as many as 150 over the last 90 days. So some people pay for it just for that feature. But you know, the opportunity is when you look at somebody's profile, they may, they may get a notification that says, oh, you looked at their profile, who is this? Oh, that looks interesting. And it kind of starts that curiosity chain going. But you can also review their content. You can like and comment on their content so that they see that you're engaging with them. And you can follow them before you offer to connect. These are all opportunities to display interest and show that you want to connect with them. And remember, because LinkedIn pays attention to who you connect with, you want to make sure that you're connecting with the right people. So when you go to invite people to connect, there's one thing that I really suggest, and that is only, only, only use the connect button on the profile view. You'll find opportunities or connect buttons on many other places on LinkedIn. The problem with those is they don't allow you to personalize the invitation. And then it looks like just anybody else's invitation. But on the profile view, when you connect, you can personalize that and say something. And I recommend that you talk about where you met, who you know in common, maybe something that they posted you that really caught your attention and why. Make it about them. I've had some people tell me that if they, they get an invitation request and it starts with the letters I, we, or our, they automatically ignore it because it's more focused on the person inviting them than about them. And so they just ignore it. The thing I recommend most is, you know, this is the opportunity where you can pretend that they are standing in front of you. Think back to when you were doing in-person networking. How did that conversation go? How did it start? You know, and why would you want to make that really any different on LinkedIn? Make it personal, make it human, because it is a human-to-human -human network. It's not B2B in that sense. And be sure to leverage the people in your first-degree network to help with those. And I always say ask people if they know this person before you just assume they do, because so many people have made connections that they don't personally know. I tend to focus on making sure I at least know something about somebody so I can recommend or refer them. Okay, moving on. One other thing I, I suggest is avoid or actually don't use automation. You'll get solicitations from outside of LinkedIn that say, hey, we've got the greatest automation tool. You can make all these connections. It's really tempting if you're in sales to do that. It is against LinkedIn's terms and conditions. You can be permanently banned for it. But to the student uh, viewer, it also is a signal that they are using automation. When you see the difference here, Aaron, for instance, sent me a personalized request to connect. Marta, on the other hand, used a bot. And the way I can tell is that little dot that's next to the first letter in my name, that shows up when bots scrape your name and just automatically insert it into their automation tool. So it's a really easy way for me to determine who's really wanting to connect with me and why, and it's easy to ignore. So now that you've made connections, what about the people that you still wanna connect with that maybe you don't have anything in common with? What are ways you can reach them? And that's really thought leadership. And surprisingly, LinkedIn is one of the biggest content publishers out there. 97% of B2B companies use it for content distribution. If you thought it was primarily a jobs network or a hiring network, it's, it really is more surprising to see that 15% more, or there's 15 times more content distribution on there than there are job postings. But what stood out to me the most as I was researching this is that less than 1% of numbers actually post content on a weekly basis. They've got nearly 700 members in LinkedIn and only 3 million are doing weekly posts. So when you see that big green you know, part of the dartboard that says that's opportunity, here's your biggest opportunity right now is differentiating yourself by publishing content on a weekly basis. You'll be among the top 1% of people that are doing that. That helps you stand out in itself. So then the question becomes next, what do you post? What do you, what do you publish? 
And we spent half day and full day workshops with companies going through the type of content that makes sense to publish. So, and since we don't have that amount of time here today, one of the best resources I'll point you to, and you can just Google this, is the LinkedIn Pages Playbook. It's geared for company pages, which are a little bit different than personal, but there's a lot of crossover in the ideas on types of content that you can publish. And so I encourage you to take, take a look at that to get some ideas. But there's some other things you want to do when you're thinking about the content to publish. And the first is really to put content up that's going to engage people. No, they don't want to see that, you know, what you had for breakfast. It's more about business type perspectives. And in fact, what's great about LinkedIn too is you see very little political type of conversation going on out there. They really try and keep that off of the network and keep it very business focused. But engaging people also in influences a algorithm element called dwell time. That is how long you spend watching a video, how long you spend reading a post on LinkedIn, whether or not you're engaging with it as well. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Because LinkedIn wants to emphasize conversations and, and um, engagement, they're not looking to replicate Facebook or Instagram or the other channels where it's about frequency of posting. They'd rather you post less and see that your posts are driving conversations. So it's important to, to think about that and space out your posts. If you post something in the morning, don't do something again until afternoon if you wanna post that often. And if you notice that one of your posts is getting a lot of conversation, don't put up anything else to compete with that. Let that go and continue the conversation by engaging with the people that are commenting. That'll get you even greater visibility. And then the other thing people always ask too is, you know, when I post, is it okay to share personal things? And I think you want to be thoughtful about that. Some of the best and most engaging posts out there are when people tell personal stories about successes or lessons learned through failures, through work, or even personal relationships and how that impacted their ability to be better at something else. Those tend to really resonate with people. And if you can expose that level of vulnerability and transparency, it does make a difference out there. A couple other things as we go to the next slide. Here's an example of a post that is designed to engage and optimize dwell time at the same time. Marcus Sheridan's a great author, has a book out there called uh, They Ask You Answer, highly recommend it. But you can see he's got, a, there's a few lines of text that appear at the top of the post and he asks a question. And he says, and do you know what I discovered? So there's a curiosity element that says, oh, I wanna read more. And when you click that see more text on the right hand side, that sends a signal to LinkedIn, your dwell time just went up, you're engaged with this post. If you follow this format, you'll have pretty good success, you know, if you're telling the right stories in it. And you can see that he ends this by saying, what say you? He's trying to engage you with comments and likes and shares. So that's one way of doing it. And it's a very effective way. Some other things you wanna know when it comes to sharing posts, as we go to the next page, is you want to encourage people to comment and like on your posts. There are some studies done that have found that shares actually hurt your visibility. So avoid asking people to share unless they comment, but there's more details. It's far better to just say comment and like. And then if somebody does comment on your post, you want to respond within 24 hours and at least like that comment. Both of those actions get you higher visibility. And then there's a feature called tagging. That means that you can mention other people the way that you would on other social channels using the app sign and their name or their company. And that will alert them that they've been mentioned in your post. And it also oftentimes alerts their community that they've been mentioned in the post. It's a great thing to do if you've met with somebody, you have learned something about them that's worthy of sharing out there, or you've been in a meeting with a few people. Where it goes wrong is when people put 10, 15 names tagged in the post. The algorithm says at least 50% of those people need to comment on being tagged in there, and that boosts your visibility. If less than 50% comment, it actually penalizes you and reduces your visibility. So be thoughtful about who you include in those tags and make sure that they're people that are gonna comment. So if you've done all these things and you say, I still have an appetite, I want more connections, I want more business opportunities on LinkedIn, then advertising is one of those areas that you can turn to to help with that. And what we found is that many B2B marketers say it is their best value for dollars spent on advertising versus other channels, and many are planning to expand their, their budgets for LinkedIn. 
if you're looking for some particular results, if you use email traditionally, there's a feature on LinkedIn that's similar to email, but gets about twice the response rate or open rate that you'll find in email at 52%. And I'll show you one of those in a second. So let's take a look at some things about advertising that might make sense. The reason LinkedIn advertising is so effective is because it can be extremely targeted. You can, you can identify an audience as small as 300 people. Again, we're talking the C-suite particular industry, you know, very niche. It's easy to identify those. They offer multiple ad formats that you can use in order to reach out and grab people's attention. And they all fit different objectives, which we'll look at in a second. And like other forms of online advertising, you can manage your budget through clicks or through impressions, depending on what makes sense for your objective. So let's talk about objectives for a second as well. If we look at the traditional marketing funnel, there's awareness, consideration, and conversions. And you know, not every channel, whether it's Google or others, are effective at all of these. And we find for LinkedIn that the experts have, you know, who've done the studies came back and said, Right now, LinkedIn is best for consideration and conversions with website visits, engagement, and lead generation. And there are different uh, ad types that you can use to do those. So if you're looking for the other things, maybe not the best, but there are opportunities. And some of those are the way that you can advertise on LinkedIn. I'll go to the next page and look at this. Is the very first is a dynamic ad. You see these pretty much on any page where you're logged in. They put your picture on that ad next to whoever the advertiser is. Oftentimes, these are used for, by companies to get more followers to their company page, but they can also be promote, used to promote events like podcasts or things like that. They're relatively low cost. They don't have a very high click rate, but they do get brand visibility out there. But what you do see almost most within LinkedIn is the next one, which is what they call the sponsored content ad. And it's usually either an image or a video. And if you recall on the last page, we kind of X'd out video. And the reason behind that is because there's more friction in video. There's multiple decisions that a, a viewer has to look at going, one, do I want to watch the video? Two, how long do I watch the, want to watch the video? With uh, just uh, image content, everything's kind of right there and the call to action is right at the bottom. And those tend to be pretty effective. Relatively new are carousel ads. And these, use multiple window panes that scroll off to the right with a button that people click on to keep following it and often they tell a story and that's what engages people is a story is you know here are demos here's examples of how this product works things of that sort they're more expensive they're you know they take more time and effort to create but they have a, a place out there where we're seeing a lot of traction for some companies is with what's called sponsored messaging and there's two forms of that. One is what looks like an email in your messaging inbox. That's a messaging ad. The other is a conversation ad, which acts kind of like a chat bot. It starts out with a little bit of text, then it offers a couple of different uh, buttons to click on so that you can determine the direction as the, the receiver that the conversation goes. Uh, don't know a lot of data yet around conversation ads, but the messaging ads are the ones that are getting about a 52% open rate. The critical factor with those is you really have to know who your target audience is. I got one the other day and it screen scraped words from my tide, from my headline, thinking that I, like most people, had my title in there. And it was using, you know, a couple of sentences out of my headline that made absolutely no sense when they put it together. So it, it's important to, you know, always know where you're using that. So we've talked about a lot of things. The biggest one is, you know, we've, we've been forced to make changes, but the people who are willing to embrace those changes are destined for faster success out there. And LinkedIn is one of those. It's important to make sure you have an all-star buyer-centric profile. That helps you connect with the right people and be mindful of who you're connecting with. And for the ones that you're not yet connected with, but you wanna attract, think about the types of content that will engage conversation and pull people into you. And if your appetite is still even larger than that, then advertising can help fill in those gaps for you. And it can be very targeted. So with that, I'll turn it back to Cheryl for any questions that we've had come up. Great. Thanks, Gunnar. Um, we have lots of great comments coming in uh, just, you know, based on the content you've shared. And we do have questions. Before I move to the Q&A, and I'm, I'm 
looking at the time, we probably will run a few minutes over, maybe about five minutes over our allotted time, just so we can get to some of your specific questions. But um, so if you can stay on to the end, great. Uh, but again, the webinar will, recording will be shared with you after the fact in case you have to jump. But uh, again, if you have any questions around LinkedIn, I know Gunnar shared a lot of different strategies on how you can be using it across your business. And you just want to talk more about LinkedIn or even digital marketing in general, reach out to your local WSI consultant, either the consultant that referred you to this webinar, or if you need to um, have someone located for you, reach out to contact at WSIworld.com and we'll make sure one of our consultants follows up with you. Uh, again, we're here to help you guide you through this sort of stuff. So you're not in it alone and we're happy to share our expertise and sit down and chat with you. Okay. Getting to some questions. So um, you talked a little bit about uh, paid memberships to LinkedIn. And I know I have a specific question here just asking, when would it make sense to upgrade to a paid membership? So there's paid, I think there's a premium business, there's like sales navigator. So there's different aspects of, of paid LinkedIn memberships. And obviously you can have a profile just for free as well, but when would it actually make sense for someone to, to enhance their type of membership with LinkedIn? That's a question that comes up quite often. It's interesting to note that just in the last four years, LinkedIn has seen paid memberships grow from 16% to 39% of their membership base. And so there's kind of a growing desire out there for it. But here's, here's what I usually share with people is, you know, if you went out to learn how to ride a motorcycle, you probably wouldn't start with the biggest, baddest motorcycle out there. You'd kind of start small and work your way up. And so from a LinkedIn perspective, you want to do all those things that we just talked about first. You want to optimize your profile and do all those things and get used to making connections and that before you decide you want to invest into something more because you'll get a whole lot more out of the paid membership once you understand the fundamentals behind it. But it does make sense for people that are, you know, dedicated sales folks, recruiters, uh, CEOs oftentimes are C-suite like it because it allows them to see competitive intelligence that they can't see with the free version. If you like to learn, that's another reason to subscribe. LinkedIn Learning, which used to be lynda.com, is now bundled in with many of the premium services there. And there's a lot of great courses available to help you learn soft skills. Uh, even if you say, I wanna learn Excel, they've got courses across the board there that you can leverage and that's part of it. But the reason most people will upgrade is the advanced search features and give you access to find people in an even more targeted level than with the free search features. Awesome. So I, if you're getting really into the social selling aspect, I'm assuming with LinkedIn, that's where it would make sense. Yeah. Um, and speaking of that, we like you mentioned the social selling index. So where do people find their score specifically in LinkedIn? Is there a specific spot on their profile? Yeah. I mean, if you just go Google LinkedIn social selling index, one of the results there will bring you to the page that then has a button that says get your free score. Easiest way to find it. Um, if you try and memorize a link, it's always hard, but that'll get it. It's it's always there. And like I said, you know, some people may be disheartened when they first see it, but just realize it reflects the effort and the, the behaviors that you do. So you, it's just a benchmark for a starting place and to measure progress. Awesome. Now you talk right at the beginning a, a lot about reaching that all-star status of a LinkedIn profile. And so where would someone see how they're progressing towards meeting that all-star status sure when you click on your little avatar and you go in and view your profile as you scroll down on the page there's a part maybe about a third of the way down that will tell you where you are from a a profile rating perspective great um a one question around content now i know the type of content i'm not sure if you have any recommendations i mean linkedin from a maybe even demographics or how people are using it from a social platform perspective is very different from how people use Facebook or use Instagram and, and whatnot. Do you ever recommend to businesses you're working with, do they have to alter the type of content they're sharing if, uh, on LinkedIn versus the other social platforms or are there considerations they need to make there? That's a, it's a really good question. It does come up often. And it is a mistake that we see many times is that people just take the exact same content 
and blast it across all of the, the various social networks. So there's nothing differentiated about it. And I think the thing is to understand who your audience is and where they're paying attention. Instagram is great for very visually oriented graphics and, and messages that way that are gonna appeal to a certain audience, but LinkedIn is gonna look for different content. And I think that you're gonna have far more success if you strategize what content belongs on what channel based on who we're trying to reach and the message we're trying to convey. One size fits all doesn't work. Awesome. Um, now, when you were talking about content, you talked about, um, you know, uh, the difference between like not just sharing content, making sure you're putting comments and, and whatnot in your shares. You were talking about tagging people. Um, we had a specific question on the use of hashtags in LinkedIn and your posts. Um, recommendations there, do hashtags work similar in LinkedIn like they do on other social profiles to, to bring you visibility? Any recommendations on how many or, or you know, what they should be when, when you're putting them together? Yep, great question. Um, this has been an evolving thing on LinkedIn. At one time, they were kind of discouraged. Then it's like, well, don't put more than three on anything. And now the, the recommendation is anywhere between three and 10 seems to make sense, but which ones? And so one thing is if you have a company page, you want to develop a personalized or a company branded hashtag that you can always reference. The second thing is you can also research which hashtags have the most visibility. For us, one of those would be digital marketing. You know, so it makes sense for us to probably want to be seen for people looking for things under digital marketing. Think about that from your industry or your target prospect. What, you know, what messages might they be looking for the most? And then fill in with some others that, that make sense. We use one when we tell stories about uh, WSI World and things like that so that our network knows if it's from somebody in our network, it's easy to find it just by looking for hashtag WSI World. Awesome. Now, I know you, um, you might have sort of explained the dot beside your name. I mean, I think you explained it in the form of that helps you identify whether someone is trying to use automation tools to connect with you or not. Is that the primary reason you've used the dot beside your name? That is the primary reason. Okay. It, it, you know, people ask, I asked originally too, is that going to affect my ability to be found in search? It does not. You know, you can use any any type of special character there and it's not going to affect your search. But what it will do is make it very easy for you to identify when automation is being used to extend invitations and other things to you. Which just helps you identify how much time and effort someone's actually putting in to making the connection with you, right? Exactly. Um, Couple, so a question here actually, someone is, and I know we didn't really, there's so many aspects with regards to LinkedIn that you can be leveraging. Someone specifically had a comment on just, um, they're looking to run more events, promote events, do things like that. What are a couple of the maybe tips that you would have if someone's looking to drive event registration and, and promote events, not just services, but in events in LinkedIn? You know, that one could probably require a lot more time, but one thing to know is if you haven't discovered it yet, there is an event tool within LinkedIn that you can use to promote events through LinkedIn. Now, most of these are gonna be virtual events, and there are some criteria, like, you know, your, your website has to have a privacy policy in terms and conditions before they'll let you do that. But it is one way that events can be used to help get the message out. And then certainly just posting and importantly, if you have multiple employees in your organization, leverage the power of your employees because they get at least twice the reach uh, that you would as a company alone. And so if you're posting content that's of interest, think about the, the magnification that happens when they're sharing with everybody in their network about these events coming up. They're your best resource for doing that. Awesome. So I'm gonna, I'm. We're gonna do a couple more questions and then we're gonna round up. So thanks for those that are sticking on, but I, there's so much, so much stuff coming through. And what I will say is that um, if you have any further questions, we don't get it to everything today, make sure you reach out and ask your consultant. They can kind of ask very, answer your very specific questions you have. But um, one of the things that uh, people were looking for more information about was you went through a lot of different 
LinkedIn advertising um, formats, uh, types of options you can do. How would you know what one you should actually be leveraging to get the most ROI on your efforts? And I know that might be a very large yeah. question to answer, but yeah. Sometimes it's a matter of test and learn, but I will also say if you don't work with somebody who's knowledgeable on, on advertising on there, take a look at the resources that LinkedIn has available to help educate you about that. They will walk through each one of the areas. Will it make you an expert? Probably not. Until you spend money, you're really not an expert in this, but it will at least make you an informed buyer of what those services are. And then where you have questions, reach out to people that have the knowledge and, and get the help because you don't want to just throw money at something. You want to make sure it's it's set up in a way that you can see that return. And the data that they give you is pretty cool to see, you know, in, in terms of your performance on campaigns. Great. And so last question I'm going to ask, because we've had it actually asked a couple of different ways in here, and that's the concept of we all have personal profiles in LinkedIn that we can set up. And then we have these company pages that can be created too. And I wonder if you can just quickly walk through the difference between the profile page versus the company page. Um, when would it make sense to actually have a company page? Like, And, and just kind of quickly summarize because people are needing a little bit more clarification around those. Sure. So the more important of the two is always going to be your personal page. That's your brand. You may move from one company to another, but that that page stays with you. Companies, though, have an interest in having a company page, too. As we saw, there's over 30 million companies with them out there, and that is because it allows them to connect with employees and really kind of extend credibility to their employees so that when you list, I work for XYZ company, there's a link that goes right back to that company page from that personal page. But also, it's a way that when you publish content as a company, it's easy to distribute through the people that work for your company and can be seen there. More importantly, think about this. If you're standing at a soccer game and you meet somebody and you learn something about them, you go, oh, that's really cool. I know somebody I should connect you with. And then you totally forget the name of their company. You go back, you find them personally, you click on the link to their company page, and now you have access to here's all the other employees in that company which one is the right one I need to connect with and they can help me with. So it gives you kind of that double, uh, double sided exposure that makes sense. And, you know, if you're a small one person company, it still makes sense to have a company page for credibility because you can talk about different things there than you can on the personal page. Great. So I know, you know, there's some questions we didn't get to. So again, reach out to your WSI consultant if you need to have those answered or want them answered or just talk more about how you can get the most out of LinkedIn for your business. Um, uh, I also just wanted to remind people that if you want to just catch up on all of the knowledge around digital marketing, we do have a book, uh, our book, Digital Minds, a strategic approach to connecting and engaging with your customers online. It's available on Amazon. Um, it goes through even just how you can even leverage LinkedIn to uh, create more demand generation around your business as well. So there's information in that book too. Um, the, Gunner, thanks so much for joining us today. Clearly a lot of different topics on LinkedIn that we could even dive further into in the future. And I can just think of all the additional webinars we could have around LinkedIn because there's so much that can be done. Um, and so thanks again for sharing your ex expertise with everyone, your tips and tricks. Again, remember, we do have a LinkedIn checklist on how to create your all-star LinkedIn profile. So if you would like to get your hands on that, reach out to your consultant that referred you to it. They'll have a copy of that to give to you after the webinar or, or reach out to contact at WSI World. We're happy to get that to you. Um, but Thanks again to everyone for joining us today. Um, you know, as we go into the holiday season, I wish everyone a very happy holidays and a safe and prosperous new year. And we really look forward to seeing you on a future WSI webinar. So thanks again, thanks, everyone. Everybody. Have a great day.